I'm Marty Stauffer. Bison by the millions once grazed the heartland of North America. In herds so vast, they appeared as a moving blanket of deep brown. The culture, religion, and survival of native people depended on this powerful beast the Lakota Sioux called Tatanka. When the bison were slaughtered, the sacred union of people and bison was broken. Yet bison are returning, even to the Indian lands where they once roamed. Journey with me out onto the prairie and meet people of the bison. Once the two-leggeds and the four-leggeds lived together as relatives on an unbroken sea of grass. For centuries, the shaggy bison gave everything necessary for life to my people, the Plains Indians. But our story did not begin on the rolling prairie. It began far away along the Bering Sea. During the last ice age, at least 10,000 years ago, much of the Earth's water was locked up in glaciers. Ocean levels dropped dramatically, exposing a wide land bridge between Asia and Alaska. Nomadic people who relied on hunting migrated over this broad treeless corridor following the herds. The migrations of bison, moose, elk, and people into the heartland of the continent took centuries. Each generation of humans moved farther south along with their prey, eventually reaching a grassland that stretched down from present-day North Dakota for hundreds of miles. Over the centuries, a smaller species of bison replaced its Ice Age counterpart. At the same time, the hunting strategies of the people became more sophisticated. Seeking to prove their manhood, boys disguised themselves as animals and crept dangerously close to the herds. They would be the first to stampede the animals toward the trap. <laughs> Herds were driven over cliffs, into box canyons, or into enclosures built of branches and logs. My people believe that the creator, Wakantanka, made everything on earth. People, bison, trees, even rocks. Therefore, everything is our relative and sacred. With the mystical appearance of the white buffalo calf woman, the spiritual path of the people changed forever, transforming from woman to white buffalo and back to woman, 
she appeared before two Teton Sioux scouts out looking for bison. The woman brought the gift of the sacred pipe, whose parts symbolized the animals and plants of Mother Earth. She taught my people rules to live by, and then she left, transforming herself once again into a white buffalo. With the gift of the pipe, my people gave thanks to earth and sky and the four sacred directions. The smoky breath of the pipe reached skyward, carrying their prayers to Wakantaka. This peak of tribal prosperity is aptly referred to as the Indian horse culture. The great bison herds, which Native Americans called the Buffalo Nation, numbered about 50 million. In May, a month the Lakota called the moon of bright red calves, most bison cows give birth to a single calf. Spring was a time of relative peace for the Buffalo Nation. Few hunts took place when female bison were known to fiercely defend their newborns. Mother and baby learned to recognize each other by smell and sound. The 40-pound calves grow quickly on a diet of milk far richer than that of a domestic cow. Within a month, tiny horns begin to bump out. Cowbirds follow the herds, foraging on insects attracted to bison dung. Nicknamed buffalo birds, they seem to bring out the playful nature of the calves. In July, a time the Lakota called the Moon of Red Cherries, the prairie rumbles with the roars of the mighty bison bulls. Attracted to females in heat, bulls hyperinflate their nasal passages, while cows flex the muscles around their vulva. Mature bulls, at least five years old, try to gather small harems of 20 or so cows. They will fight, if necessary, for the right to breed. Urinating, then wallowing in it, advertises the virility of this 2,000-pound male.
Caught up in the excitement of the breeding season, young bulls mount each other. Even calves can catch the fever of the rut. The first written descriptions of the spectacle of bison on the prairie described herds 50 miles long and 20 miles wide. What looked like one massive herd was actually many female-led family groups of between 50 and 100 animals. Herds favored prairie dog towns with their succulent grasses and forbs clipped short by the rodents. Enriched by the exceptional bounty of the prairie and mounted on their sacred dogs, the hearts of my people sang for joy. As long as the Buffalo Nation was strong, so too would they be. Between 1830 and 1870, Buffalo hunters were encroaching onto Indian lands. Bison were being killed for robes, for meat, and even for their tongues. The herds moved farther west, but by the early 1870s, there was no place left to run. Yeah, there's a buffalo herd down there. A tanning process was invented to make quality leather from bison skin, and a rifle was perfected to bring down a bison from as far away as half a mile. Hunters got $2 for a hide and 25 cents for a tongue. With the Sharps rifle, they could kill a hundred bison in a single day. General Phil Sheridan once advocated the extermination of the Indian's commissary. One popular slogan of the day read, every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. The bison had become victims in the search for a political solution to the so-called Indian problem. Settlers from the east were spilling out across the prairie. Ironically, they followed trails made by the bison herds. Before the 1890s had passed, the Buffalo Nation had been crushed. Fewer than a thousand bison remained. The Plains Indians were forced onto reservations and the wanton slaughter spilled over to elk that had also flourished on the prairies. One of the few places that bison and elk remained was in Yellowstone Park. Yet even here they were not safe. The government turned a blind eye to poachers. Soon, fewer than 200 head of bison survived in Yellowstone. Had it not been for the individual effort of Moses Harris, a cavalry captain assigned to the park, poachers would have wiped out the tiny herd. By the very slimmest of margins, the plains bison as a species survived their brush with extinction. Using their heavy heads and powerful neck muscles, they can plow through four feet of snow to graze. Their dense coats grow long. Coarse guard hairs cover thick, woolly undercoats. Today, over 3,000 head are found in Yellowstone, protected as long as they remain within the boundaries of the park. Known to live 40 years in captivity, 
bison rarely survive past 20 in the wild. Winter will soon claim this weakened cow. But nothing in nature is wasted. Death for one means life for others. Bison and Yellowstone are the only free-ranging herd in the United States. Several thousand more live within the confines of parks, like Custer in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Each autumn, nearly 1,500 head are rounded up, inoculated, branded, and either held for sale or released. Many are bought by ranchers who have traded in their non-native cattle for these native grazers. Some of the nation's best are exhibited and sold at Denver's National Western Stock Show. Over 90% of the bison in the United States are raised on ranches. Not only is it a profitable business, more often than not, it is an ecologically sound one. Given room to roam, bison are much less damaging to the environment than cattle. With one-third more protein and 90% less fat, bison meat is a healthy, low-cholesterol alternative to beef. Some of the finest restaurants in the country proudly serve it. The thunder of bison hooves is even echoing once again across the lands of Native Americans. Winter on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in central South Dakota is a time of bitter cold. The bison, instilled with the age-old urge to roam, have escaped across the frozen Missouri River and must be driven back home. Some Lakota still use horses to work their bison in summer, but snowmobiles are a practical alternative on a frigid February morning. The Lakota people of the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation own a herd of 700 animals. They are one of 40 tribes which belong to the Intertribal Bison Cooperative. The co-op has one primary goal, return bison to native lands. They believe that the return of Tatanka, their great shaggy relative, is critical to improving the physical health of their people and to mending the spiritual fabric of their lives. These young bulls are being weighed and sorted. Some will be sold and others will be used to feed the people. Few will be honored in the artwork of the native people of the northern Great Plains. Here, at Prairie Edge in Rapid City, Indian craftsmen use traditional techniques and materials to recapture the culture, mysticism, and wonder of their ancestors. Central to all important Lakota Sioux ceremonies, 
was the bison skull. It represents the power of the once great four-legged buffalo nation, which long ago sent the white buffalo calf woman to the people. Beautiful handmade gifts hang on the gate of a tiny Wisconsin farm. Here, Native Americans by the thousands continue to make a pilgrimage. They come to see the return of the white buffalo calf woman in the form of a female white bison calf named Miracle. At birth, she was white as snow, quite a standout among her brown companions. Dave Hyder, her owner, could hardly imagine the effect she would have. In the four months following her birth, 25,000 people walked down the packed dirt pathway to her pasture. Many Native Americans came, simply giving thanks. For me, seeing that little buffalo today is a reminder that we need to continue to love and respect each other regardless of what way each of us have, have chosen. But also at the same time, people need to respect the significance of that little white buffalo calf and, and what it means to the Indian people. This is really old history to us. And this is a fact that the white buffalo came and she was a woman and she said she was going to return. And here's the white buffalo. Even if it's turning brown or gray, it's still a white buffalo. You put the buffalo in the state park, you put the Indian on a reservation, but our spirit, our spirit will never die. The largest native-owned bison herd in the country belongs to the Crow Indians of southern Montana. A helicopter and wranglers work together to round up nearly 1,500 head of bison. The animals are driven toward an enclosure where other tribal members will close in. Crow need few fences around their 16,000 acre buffalo pasture atop the Bighorn Mountains. The herd is held in by the sheer cliffs of the Bighorn Canyon. adage, you can herd a bison any place it wants to go, is foremost in the minds of the Roundup team. bison across the deep canyon to the corrals atop Monument Ridge, the veteran helicopter pilot pushes them along a well-worn trail. Once the winded animals crest the canyon trail, the tribe, like hunters of old, 
closes in. The young bison brought in today will be inoculated. Many will be sold to herds in the United States and Canada. A few will be given to other tribes, eager for the return of their powerful relative. In 1890, a Lakota man had a prophetic vision. The dark night of the Lakota, the vision said, will last 100 years, but in the seventh generation, the sacred hoop will be mended. With the return of the bison, the healing has begun for this, the seventh generation of the great tribes of the prairie. Hundreds of thousands of bison live on reservations and in sanctuaries across the country. This is a mixed blessing for native people who fear that bison will be turned into nothing more than glorified cows. We would all do well to also honor and respect this unique creature, an animal sacred to the people of the bison. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, Enjoy our wild America.